Film photography can be an overwhelming hobby to get into. If you do a Google search for film photography, you'll immediately be bombarded by a ton of great sources offering guides on what it is, where to start, and why it will ultimately save us from AI. Thanks for that one, F-stoppers. When I picked up film photography as a quarantine hobby in 2020, I saw all of this, was immediately overwhelmed, and closed that tab out. The only photography experience I had came from taking pictures on my phone and whatever latent knowledge I'd picked up via osmosis by growing up around my mom and my older sister, both of whom were serious photographers at different points in my childhood. So I did what any sane person would do, and I taught myself by trial and error. Three years and just under 100 rolls of film later, I'm finally starting to feel confident in what I can do with a camera and just a roll of film. I'm by no means a professional at this, but I do want to share what I've learned with anyone who is looking to get into film photography for the first time. I'm Kyle and welcome back to my special interest. Before we jump in, I just want to quickly do some shameless self-promotion. This is my first video I've posted on this channel, so it would really help me out a lot if you dropped a like on the video as well as subscribe to the channel. Also, if you'd like to see more of my photography work, I've left my Instagram in the description down below as well as a link to my print shop if you'd like to help me out in that way. Anyways, that's enough of that, let's just get into the video. In today's video, we're going to go through everything you might need to know if you're interested in getting into film photography in 2023. I'm going to try and cover as many important points as I can, so it's possible if you're already into photography, you may already know some of the information I'll be sharing, but I'll leave some timestamps in the description so you can skip around to the topics you're interested in learning more about. Also, even with this video being as long as it is, I'm not going to be able to cover every topic as extensively as I would like to. So I'm going to follow up this video with a Q&A covering the most asked questions that I get on this video. So if you want more clarification on any topic in particular, leave a comment down below and I'll cover it in that video. I'll also be operating under the assumption that you already have some interest in film photography. I won't be trying to persuade you that film is better than digital or anything like that. This video will be purely information about getting started in film photography. I'm about to throw a table of contents on the screen with timestamps, so if you want to skip around, pause the video now. If you're starting from the beginning though, we're going to be here for a while, so grab yourself a drink, get a snack, and get comfortable. The first huge piece of advice that I want to give you before we go any further is to ask your family about cameras. Film photography was the only form of photography for a while, so it's possible that someone in your family has a camera lying around that they may let you borrow or even have if you just ask around a little bit. I come from a family full of photographers, so when I was looking to get into film photography during the lockdown of 2020, I asked my mom and she gave me this beautiful Minolta SRT 101 to learn on. Now it would be crazy to expect for all of these cameras to be in perfect working order, especially if they've just been sitting on a shelf for the last decade or two. So be sure to check out all the functions of it before you put any film in it. And make sure to get it professionally cleaned if anything seems off to you. I know that sounds scary and expensive, but there are places that do cleanings and stuff like this for some of the more common film cameras for around 50 to 60 bucks. I'll leave some links in the description as well if you need any of those services. I think to better understand the smaller points that we'll get into later, it will be helpful to start by looking at the overall process of film photography. So let's start there. I'm going to quickly run you through an average example of what it looks like to shoot a roll of 35mm film. To get started, you'll want to grab your camera of choice. I'm going to be using the Minolta X370 for this example. Next, you will select and load a roll of film into the camera and make sure you set the ISO to match the speed of the film you're using. This is usually in the name of the film stock or at least printed somewhere on the box or the canister that the film comes in. In this case, I'm going to be using Cinestill 800T, so I will set my camera's ISO to 800 to match that. After you've loaded your camera, it's time to shoot. The exact process for this will depend on the camera you're using, so be sure to consult your camera's manual before you begin or at any point during the process if you get confused. In my case, the X370 is mostly manual controlled, but it does have a built-in light meter and an automatic aperture priority mode. There's one more crucial thing to know about shooting film. It is very important that you do not open your camera again 
until you've finished the roll and rewound the film back into the canister. Film is light sensitive and opening it mid-roll will expose the film to light and effectively ruin that roll of film. Outside of very specific film formats, you cannot change film stocks in the middle of a roll. So it's important to know that you're committing to 24 to 36 shots of whatever film that you load into your camera. After you shot through your roll, it's time to rewind and unload your film. Again, this process is slightly different depending on the camera, so be sure to consult the manual for your specific camera. For the X370, there's a button to press on the bottom of the camera to release the film. And then you'll find this small rewind handle that flips out of the knob you use to set the ISO. And you'll use that to rewind until you don't feel any more resistance. Now you can safely open the back of your camera the same way you did to load it. And your film should be safely back inside the canister. As a quick note, if this is the first roll of film that you've shot with this camera, I would caution you to wait to load another roll in until you've gotten your scans back for this first roll. This is just be 100% sure that your camera is functioning properly and that there are no problems with it that will ruin your photos. This is usually referred to as a test roll and it's something that I do with every camera that I buy regardless of how confident I am in the condition. Most film cameras are generally anywhere from 20 to upwards of 60 or even 70 years old and they'll probably need some TLC every now and then so it's better to know that ahead of time than to find out the hard way. Anyways, let's get back to the subject at hand. After you've unloaded your film, you'll need to get it developed and scanned. I won't go super far into detail on this process just yet. Just think of it as the process of getting the pictures to show up, kind of like a Polaroid, but it's not instant. You'll then have to get those pictures scanned so you can see them digitally on your phone or computer or whatever. Although film has been out of the mainstream for quite a while, there still may be some places near you that do offer developing and scanning services. You'll just have to check the internet. Although it may seem convenient at first, I would strongly caution you against taking your film to somewhere like a Walgreens or Walmart or CVS. A lot of these places do still offer developing and scanning services, but none of them are doing it in-house anymore. They're all mailing it off to a facility or a warehouse or something somewhere. They're not doing it themselves. And I've heard horror stories of people's photos being ruined or lost or otherwise just not getting the results they wanted. In place of this, I would urge you to either find a local photo lab that does this service or if there are none available, mail it off to a reputable lab somewhere else. I personally use Nice Film Lab in Brooklyn, but I also highly recommend either Memphis Film Lab or The Dark Room. All of these places do fantastic work and you can usually get some kind of lower quality scan fairly cheap if you're still unsure about jumping into high quality scans or anything. The one factor all these places do have in common though is that you'll have to wait. Even if you can find a local lab to take your film to, most places aren't offering same day turnarounds anymore, so you'll still probably be waiting a few business days along with the potential mailing time for having to send your film off to a lab. After your film is developed and scanned by the lab, you will usually get some kind of link to download the photos. The local lab in my town does thumb drives for scans, so it's possible your lab may do that too, but most places have moved to something like Dropbox or their own online download portal. We'll talk about this more in depth later, but the lab will also mail back your negatives if this is something that you've chosen when you placed your order online. Now that we covered the basic overview of the process, let's dive into each topic a little bit more in depth, starting with the film part. Let's start with the basics. Film itself is a strip of transparent acetate backing that is covered with a gelatin-based emulsion. This emulsion also contains microscopic particles of silver halide that make it sensitive to light. A fun fact for you, the grain look of film is actually the presence of said microscopic particles of silver halide. Higher ISO film is usually grainier, and that is because it needs more silver halide particles to give it more light sensitivity. If you didn't understand much or any of that, don't worry too much about it. It's cool knowledge to have, and it can be helpful to understand exactly how all the pieces of the process work together, but this won't make or break your understanding of how to shoot film. It's just cool. Film comes in a few different varieties. Color negative film, color positive or slide film, black and white film, which can also be negative or positive, as well as instant film. The categories are fairly self-explanatory. Color film gives you full color photos, black and white film records only monochromatic images, and instant film is your like Polaroid or Instax film that prints your photo out and you get to watch it develop. For our purposes in this video, I won't be covering instant photography anymore going forward. It's not really my area of interest, and I think there are other people who have done better videos on the topic. The positive and negative labels refer to how the film actually produces an image. Positive film, also called slide film, 
produces an image exactly as you would expect to see it. This is commonly used for projecting images via the use of slides, and that's where the term slideshow comes from, by the way. The trade-off for this style is that it is more expensive to produce and is less forgiving on the exposure department. You've really got to nail your settings for this film. On the other side, negative film produces an inverted image. This negative image is then inverted to a positive image either in the darkroom or now in the scanning process of 2023 where everything is eventually converted to a digital file. Negative film is cheaper and easier to produce and it is way more forgiving than positive film is. You can often overexpose negative image by a few extra stops of light and still get a usable image out of it. Today, negative film makes up the vast majority of film stocks that are available and still in production. At its peak, each of these different types of film came in a number of different sizes and cartridge styles. Since the early 2000s when digital became the dominant medium for photography, most of the older or more obscure formats for film have been discontinued and only a few still remain in production today. The two most important to know about when you're just getting started are 35mm and 120, also called medium format. There are a couple other formats like 110 and large format that are still available, but for our purposes today we aren't going to touch on these too in depth. Lastly, if you have a camera that takes a different or more obscure format of film, it may still be possible to get film for it from somewhere like the Film Photography Project, but it's definitely going to be more difficult and potentially more expensive to get your hands on. If you're not sure what format of film your camera takes, you can usually find it in the manual or on an informational website like Camera Wiki. But if you're just starting out and trying to figure out where to get started or where to jump in, your best bet is either 35mm or 120, so let's talk about those first. Chances are when you think of the word film, you probably picture a cartridge that looks like this. This is 35 millimeter film. It's actually technically 24 by 36 millimeters in size. It comes in this cartridge with a little bit of a lead coming out for you to load into your camera. This is overwhelmingly the most popular and accessible format of film. 35 millimeter provides a good balance between the quality that you can get with something like medium format with the accessibility and ease of use and affordability that comes from having the film in a little cartridge like this. Today, 35 millimeter film is probably the most common type of film you're gonna be able to find, and it also provides the best value you're going to get. As of recording this on B&H, a roll of color negative 35 millimeter film will run you somewhere between $11 for something like Kodak Ultramax or Fuji 200, or up to around $18 for the higher end things like Kodak's Portra 800. If you like the look of black and white photos, that type of film is always the cheaper option, and currently most of the common film stocks for that are between $6 50 and $10 on BH. Per frame on a 36 exposure roll, this comes out to between 31 cents and 50 cents for color negative film, and between 18 cents to 28 cents per frame for black and white film. Because 35mm film is historically and currently the most popular and common format, 35mm cameras are also super common and much more affordable to get your hands on than something in the medium or large format world. It does obviously depend on where you shop and what kind of camera you're looking for, but you can definitely get yourself a good camera to start and learn on for at or maybe even under $100. Again, I'm going to have a more in-depth section later on in the video about cameras specifically, but I just wanted to give you some price context up front. Taking all of this into consideration, this is definitely the place I'd recommend you start if you want to get into film photography. This is where I got started and it gives you a good idea of the experience and the process without breaking the bank as much as something like medium format, which is what we're going to talk about next. Stepping up in size a little bit, we get to medium format or 120 film. I'll be honest, I have no idea where the 120 moniker comes in reference to medium format film. I've tried to look it up, I've tried to Google it, and I can't find anything. So if you know, please let me know in the comments because I'm incredibly curious. This format is actually one of the oldest surviving formats of photography dating all the way back to the Kodak Brownie number no. 2 introduced in 1901. At the time, it was considered an amateur format, actually, which I guess if you're comparing it to sheet film, then yeah, I can see that. From a technical standpoint, medium format film is a roll film that comes attached to backing paper that is rolled around a spool with a little bit of extra paper on either side to load into the camera 
just like the lead on a 35 millimeter roll. One of the most interesting aspects of 120 film is that the actual aspect ratio depends on the camera, not the film itself. Generally, the frame is six centimeters tall, but the width and therefore the aspect ratio tends to vary from camera to camera. Most common sizes are six by 4.5, six by six, 6.7, and six by nine, but it can go all the way up to six by 17 or six by 24. This larger negative and therefore focal plane gives the format an incredible amount of detail and it makes it better at handling more varied levels of light and exposure. And when I say detail, I'm not exaggerating. Smarter people than me have tried to calculate the megapixel equivalent for medium format film and the figure that they land on is somewhere between 200 and 400 megapixels, depending on the film stock and the frame size. Obviously this step up in quality and negative size does lead to an increase in price, both for the film and the cameras. The film itself, in my opinion, is not a huge jump in price from 35 millimeter, but the real cost comes from the number of frames that you get on a roll. The number of frames you get out of a roll of 120 or medium format film depends on the camera that you use and the frame size that it shoots. So if you're shooting one of the smaller sizes like 6x4.5, then you'll get around 15 to 16 frames per roll. For example, let's say that the roll of film that you're shooting cost $11. With those 15 to 16 frames, that'll cost you between 69 to 73 cents per frame. That's not too bad. But cameras like my Moskva 2 shoot a 6x9 negative, which only gives me 8 frames on a roll. Now that $11 roll of film is costing about $1.75 per shot. That'll hurt the wallet, especially if you want to use this for any kind of big shoot or professional application where you're going to be burning through rolls and trying to capture everything you can. Before we wrap up the film section, let's quickly run through the other formats that still exist but are a little bit less common. 110 film is the smallest film format that is still in production, at least in some capacity. It's loaded in these little cartridges that typically snap onto the back of your camera, and each frame is roughly 13 millimeters by 17 millimeters, or roughly half the size of a 35 millimeter frame. The biggest appeal for 110 film is that it's small, and therefore the cameras that use it can also be smaller than if they use something like 35 millimeter or 120 film. This format was super popular with like travel cameras and novelty cameras like toys or branded promotional cameras. I kind of alluded to this earlier, but 110 is only barely still in production. Fujifilm ceased production on 110 film in 2009, and Kodak followed in the subsequent years, although I couldn't find a firm date of exactly when they discontinued their production. Our lords and saviors over at Lomography reintroduced 110 film in 2012, following some small batch releases by the Hong Kong-based company Films Reborn. As of the recording of this video in 2023, Lomography is the only company still actively producing new 110 film. They do offer a handful of different film stocks in 110 though, so if you're looking to try it out, they're going to be the place for you to go for film. Speaking of barely in production, large format. <laughs> Large format is generally used to refer to basically anything bigger than medium format. The most common sizes that I've seen are 4x5 inches and 8x10 inches, and it usually comes in these really big sheets of film. Think like literally printer paper that you can load into your camera. And actually, you can still buy it fresh and new, and in more places than 110 film, honestly. Right now at B&H, a pack of 4x5 Portra 400 will run you around $75 for 10 sheets, or or around $7.50 per shot, which honestly is not as bad as I expected it to be before I made this video. Sheet film is shot in the style of camera you've probably seen in movies or TV shows, uh, where they have the sheet over their head and the flash bulb in their hands. I've never shot this format, so I have no experience with it, but from my understanding, basically everything about this format makes it a challenge. But you know, maybe that's your thing. Okay, that was a lot of information, so now let me give you my recommendation. In general, I would recommend starting out with 35mm film. It's going to give you a good look into the overall process and look of film photography without being as expensive to get into. As for what specific type of film, if you've never shot film at all, or especially if you're new to photography in general, I would suggest you start with black and white film, specifically something like Kentmere 400. It's a super cheap film, so if you mess something up with loading or unloading, or if some shots don't really come out very well, or you have camera problems, you're not losing like $15 a roll, you're losing six. 
Plus the 400 ISO rating gives it a little bit more flexibility in lighting and you're not going to be as limited as if you chose something like Kentmere 100, for example. If you're really set on jumping straight into color, there's not really a budget option anymore. I would look and try and find something like Kodak Color Plus 200 or Ultramax 400 or maybe Fuji 200 or 400. Honestly, just whatever you can get your hands on the cheapest. These are all great film stocks, so it's going to be hard to go wrong with any of them. When you're just starting out, the most important thing is to really learn your camera and the process more than to find the perfect film stock for you. Film photography is kind of a never-ending learning process, so it's going to be a slow start and that's okay. If you haven't shot film before, you may think it is like super obscure and hard to find since it's no longer the dominant medium for photography. And while it is less common than it used to be, it's not as hard to find as you might think. A couple of the Walmarts here in Memphis actually usually have Fuji 400 in stock as well as some of their disposable cameras. And the targets here have recently started carrying Kodak Ultramax 400 as well. Obviously, these are only two different film stocks, and I did allude to the fact that they are not always reliably in stock. So for most other options, you're either going to have to find a local store near you that carries them or order it online. I'll give you some recommendations about where to order it online in a second, but first you're going to get my rant about local stores. Please shop local. If you can, obviously, but I would highly encourage you to seek out and spend your money on film at the local stores near you that are carrying it. Contrary to what the internet and algorithms may have you believe, film is still not popular by any means, and it's a risk for any of these businesses to stock it at all, so please support local businesses near you if you have them. I'm in the Memphis area, so I mostly know the Mid-South, but I would look at Bedford Cameras based in Little Rock, Safe Light Imaging in Nashville, Roberts Cameras in Indiana. Indianapolis and Central Camera in Chicago. In the New York City area, there's a lot of options, including Photodom New York, Brooklyn Film Camera, and obviously the Ever Eternal B&H. There are obviously tons more local shops that I don't know about, but these are all places that I've shopped from, and I would recommend all of them. If you aren't close to any of these, definitely do a Google search for buy 35mm film in blank or near me, and if there are any businesses near you that have them, you should be able to find them that way. For me in Memphis, my closest option is in Nashville, so you may still have to drive a little bit if you want to go in person, but most of these places will still also allow you to order online, so let's talk about that now. Buying film online is way easier than buying cameras. Honestly, most places online you can buy camera gear, you can also probably get film. But there's a fine line between something like Walmart, who happens to sell film online and sometimes have it in their store, and somewhere like B&H, where photography equipment is like their whole thing. On top of having a better selection of films to choose from, they will usually have better prices, curated recommendations, way more detailed product listings, and better options to filter and search for what you actually need. Also, I've just got to say it, please don't order from Amazon. They don't need your film money. Please use it to support a small business or at least not a mega corporation. Anyways, my recommendations for ordering film online are, in no particular order, B&H, Photodom New York City, The Film Photography Project, especially for more obscure film formats, Brooklyn Film Camera, Bedford Photo, Lomography, and Adorama. All of these sites usually have a solid selection of color and black and white film stocks available, and they have pretty detailed informational sections for all of them as well. Another thing to know about buying film is that because it's produced in limited quantity batches, you're probably going to have to jump around between a few sites to find what you're looking for. It really just depends on who has what film stocks in stock at a given time, but you should still be able to find the like two or three sites that you like, and between them they should have most of what you need most of the time. It's time to talk about cameras. Let me start off by saying it would be impossible for me to adequately cover every camera for film or every factor that goes into buying a camera for film photography in one video. So what I'm going to be doing instead is giving you some broad information as well as some tips for buying a camera and I'll leave the choices and research parts to you. So let's jump in. Broadly speaking, the main categories of cameras you'll find in film photography are going to be SLR or single lens reflex, TLR, 
or twin lens reflex, range finder, and point and shoots. Again, there are some other types of cameras out there, but broadly speaking, these are the biggest buckets that most cameras will fall into. SLR stands for single lens reflex. If you've done any digital photography before, you've probably seen or at least heard of a DSLR camera. DSLR or digital single lens reflex cameras are just the younger brother of the film SLR style camera. These cameras have a mirror that lets you look directly through the lens to see a good approximation of what your image will look like. This is probably the most common type of 35mm film camera, and for good reason. They're extremely reliable and flexible cameras. Also, because a lot of SLR cameras are fairly old, they will use mostly or fully mechanical designs, meaning that there's little to no electronic elements that can fail. This makes them super easy to fix up and clean. Plus, a lot of older models like my Minolta SRT-101 that I mentioned earlier, which was released in 1966, only use electronic components for the light meter, meaning that they can still be operated entirely without batteries. SLRs also allow for interchangeable lenses, so you can get lots of options in that area. And if you use something like a Nikon or Canon that are still around today, some of their newer lenses will actually work with their film SLR models. These are all big positives in the SLR cameras category, but the biggest drawback is the mirror. It does give you the ability to accurately frame and focus your images, but the slap of the mirror coming down can be loud, and it can also add some unwanted camera shake at longer shutter speeds. Moving on to twin lens reflex or TLR cameras. Even if you've never looked into film photography at all before, you've probably seen this camera before. This is a Roliflex, and it's easily the most recognizable example of a TLR camera. These cameras ditch the mirror approach and instead use two fixed lenses with the same focal length to let you frame and shoot your images. One lens lets you see the image you're composing on a viewfinder screen, while the other one actually exposes the film to light. These cameras usually have a top-down viewfinder, which is really fun to shoot with, but it can make them a bit impractical for some applications. But, like I just said, they're really fun to shoot with, and they do produce some incredible images. Rangefinder cameras have also become very popular in the recent film revival, mostly thanks to things like the Leica M6 becoming the new gold standard for film cameras. I'll be honest, some of how these cameras work is kind of like magic to me, but I'm going to try and explain it to the best of my ability. Most rangefinder cameras work by using a mirror to overlay a focusing image on top of your viewfinder image. You simply line these two images up and your picture should now be in focus. This is a bit hard to grasp without seeing in action, so I'm going to put a video or picture example on screen of exactly what this looks like in action. Because of this magical nifty focusing system, the cameras can be a lot smaller since there's no big mirror in the middle of it to let you see through the lens. Rangefinders are also much quieter than their SLR counterparts because, again, there's no big mirror slapping down, and this makes them a favorite among street photographers. The drawback of this style of camera is that you're technically not viewing exactly what's coming through the lens, so your final image is always going to be slightly off of what you were framing, even if it's just by a little bit. Despite this, these cameras are incredibly fun to use and can produce some of the best images you can get in film photography from fairly compact and discreet designs. If you don't know anything about photography going into this and you just want to jump into taking film photos, a point and shoot camera is a great place to start out. These aptly named little cameras take care of the hard work for you, handling things like exposure settings, focusing, winding and rewinding the film, and they also usually include a built-in flash for limited lighting situations and indoor shooting. Quite literally, you just point and shoot. The second camera that I got and the first one that I bought myself was this little Canon SureShot. I love this camera to death, quite literally, because it died like two months after I bought it. I was getting discouraged by the results of my all-manual endeavors with the Minolta SRT-101, and I wanted something that would be easy to use and to take with me while I was traveling. After the SureShot died on me, I ended up buying myself the... Pentax IQ Zoom 700, and it's still probably the camera that I've used the most in my three years of shooting film, purely just because of how convenient and easy it is to shoot with. All right, now let's talk about a tip that will save you countless hours of frustration and a lot of money on wasted film. I know, what a boring tip. I didn't want to do this either, but you waste enough rolls of film and you get a bit desperate. 
I don't want to exaggerate this, but almost every single problem that I've run into with a camera that has given me any ounce of frustration has been solved by either one, reading the manual, or two, getting the camera cleaned. These cameras are fairly old and a lot of the technology was still being worked out. As a product of this, film cameras have some weird quirks that are specific to their era and the problems they were trying to solve. Most cameras' quirks are just minor inconveniences like some features not working at the same time or being locked into limited settings for some reason, but in rare instances they can be way more serious. For example, this Fed 5B that I love so dearly has a really weirdly designed shutter firing system. And if you change the shutter speed before you wind the film to the next frame, you can permanently break the shutter system. Now, I usually immediately wind my film to the next frame as soon as I've taken my shot, but had I not known this, and if I didn't read the manual, all it would take is the one time that I forgot or didn't think about it to render this camera completely unusable. Again, I'll reiterate, it's usually nothing that serious, but I would still highly encourage you to read the manual before you go shoot and before you load up your camera at all. Sometimes you'll get lucky and your camera will come with the original manual. That was the case for me with this Minolta X370, but more often than not, you'll just have to find a PDF version online. As far as finding manuals goes, Google is going to be your best friend. This usually literally takes like 30 seconds. Just punch in something like blank camera manual PDF and usually one of the first few results will be a PDF scan of the whole manual. I would also definitely recommend saving these for later use as well. I use these all the time, so I have a note on my phone with all of my PDF manuals in there, just in case I need to reference them while I'm not at home. Side note, did you know you could save PDFs to the Notes app? Absolute game changer. Going into this video, I'm sure the first question most of you probably had is where do I get a film camera? Or perhaps where is the best place to buy a film camera? And worry not, I have answers for you. I have actually answered this question enough times that I have a note in my phone already that I send to people whenever they ask because I've been asked a handful of times already just by friends and family and whatnot. So without further ado, here is my recommendations for where to buy your first or second or fifth film camera. The first place most of you probably thought of was eBay. This is probably where you'll find the most options for cameras, both in variety and in sheer number of listings. There are definitely pros and cons to shopping here, and I'll be honest, it's not my favorite option. But either way, let me run you through some reasons why you may or may not want to buy a film camera here. First, eBay has established itself as basically the place to safely sell your stuff on the internet. Because of this, there are basically endless pages of people selling cameras that they or their family once used to use, or businesses just listing cameras that they actually have in stock themselves. This gives you a ton of options, but the downside is that there's a massive parity in the quality of listings that you'll come across. It could be an absolute steal on a camera because someone doesn't know how valuable that camera is, or it could not work at all when you get it. Again, this is not always the case, and there are plenty of great sellers on eBay who sell refurbished or cleaned up cameras for good prices. And I also know plenty of people who exclusively shop on eBay for all of their camera gear. My point is mostly just to be extra cautious when you're shopping and read listings very carefully. Look for words like tested and working, CLA, cleaned, and look closely at anything marked as is because you will likely not be able to return or get any refund for those listings. If eBay wasn't your first thought, thrifting probably was. This was actually my first thought, but it's definitely a shot in the dark. Similar to buying anything at a thrift store, your luck with cameras is going to depend solely on what people have brought in to sell. I have bought four cameras from various thrift stores over the last two years, and none of them work. Obviously, I probably wouldn't have bought them if I knew they didn't work, but in my defense, only one of them was film, and I didn't know that the film it took was not in production anymore, so that one zombie. This is obviously not the universal truth for thrifting film cameras. There are countless YouTube videos of people getting really good deals from thrift stores on working cameras. That's just not been my experience. If you don't want to repeat my mistake, you can bring a few batteries with you and use those to test any cameras that you might want to buy. I'd probably go with a couple of AA and AAAs, as well as some more niche options that I'll list on the screen. Just bring a few of those with you and try your luck. 
Be warned though, film cameras do take a surprisingly wide variety of batteries, depending on like the era of camera you're looking at. So it's possible that even with these batteries with you, you'll encounter a camera that takes something that you don't have batteries with, and then you're back at square one basically. In that case, you'll just have to use your best judgment and decide if the price is worth it for you, even if the camera doesn't work. My usual tactic is to check the internet for prices on both working and not working listings for a particular camera that I'm looking at and do my best judgment call on like if I'd be willing to pay this price if it doesn't work at all. In summary, you're kind of just shooting blind. You just got to weigh the price for yourself and decide if the price for that camera is worth it if it doesn't work. This one may surprise you a little bit, but B&H does actually have a use section along with their usual new options as well. This is both online on their website and at their actual New York City store. So if you're in the area, you can check that out in person. I visited B&H for the first time last summer when I was in New York and it was kind of a surreal experience to see that many options for film cameras and stuff all in one place. For new cameras, there's not much actually happening in the film world, so you're going to be looking at a number of different styles of basically reusable disposables, as well as things like the Hoga 120 camera and Lomography's line of experimental cameras. These are not bad places to start if you're looking for an easy entry point. Um, I have both the Lomography Diana Mini as well as a Target brand reusable disposable and I enjoy them both a lot for what they are and how easy they are to use. But if you're looking for a higher end option, B&H does have a used film camera section on their website. The film selection is obviously smaller than their comparable digital selection just because film isn't the dominant medium anymore, but they do still have plenty of options. The important thing is that what they do offer is tested and listed with a condition grade and notes about the general status of the gear. I'll go ahead and let you know the cameras are generally fairly expensive, but the trade-off is that you know exactly what you're getting on the front end before you pull the trigger on it. Photodom is one of my favorite places on the internet to shop for any kind of film gear just in general. Their use section is huge and they are constantly adding a ton of listings to their website so you're always going to have something new to look for every few weeks or so if you want to check that out. They also test and clean all of their cameras before listing so you know that you're getting a good working camera if you buy from them. Again, the price is a little bit higher than buying from somewhere like eBay but the quality is 100% worth the price and you know you're getting something that will work rather than having to pay to fix a camera or buy another one in a few months. If you're in the New York City area, you can visit them at their shop in Brooklyn. I also went when I was there last summer and they've got a really cool setup. They carry a lot of cool film and camera related accessories like this little B&H slash Black Lives Matter pin that I keep on my daily carry camera bag. This is kind of my secret weapon for buying camera gear online. I've only ever seen a few people talk about this website online before, but I've bought a camera and some super niche accessories from them and it was all super affordable in great condition and all was delivered ahead of when it was supposed to. They also have condition listings that you can browse by as well as notes on specific listings if the condition needs a little bit more explanation or something. Again, this means you know exactly what you're getting on the front end before you even spend your money on it. Highly recommend this site for cameras or whatever kind of accessories or gear you may need. So Ke is one of the largest online marketplaces for camera gear of all varieties and luckily for our purposes that also includes film. They have a huge selection of complete cameras, bodies, lenses, cases, whatever you might be looking for and it's all meticulously graded and priced according to those grades. They also include notes on their listings for why gear is graded the way it is, which again, makes it super easy to see exactly what you're getting before you even commit to purchasing it. The only problem I've ever run into with shopping here is that they almost have so many options it can be kind of hard to sift through, but that is a good problem to have. And they do also have a great browsing experience and you get a lot of filters to try and sift through and to narrow your search. Just be careful because I have 100% filtered down my results so far there were zero left. So you're sometimes left kind of filtering one section at a time until you kind of narrow your options down. Next on the list is NH cameras based in Chicago. 
According to their website, they started as a one-man operation, and they're still a smaller, more niche business, but the things they do carry are really great quality. NH primarily focuses on cameras. You may have guessed that from the name already, but they do also do grab bags of like expired film, merch, and as of recently, they've started carrying these little digicams like the early 2000s point and shoots. I actually picked up one of those from them a few months ago, this little Kodak C613, and it's been a lot of fun to use as like a cheap little daily camera. Carry. All of their cameras are cleaned and film tested, and they have a 30-day warranty included with them, so again, you know you're getting a working camera. This is another of my little back pocket weapons that I don't see much discussion about online. Retrospect is a vintage technology website that sells everything from records to film cameras to vintage video games. I love this place. One of the reasons I love it so much is that they clean, repair, and refurbish all of their items, including their cameras. This means that what you buy will work, but they do also still usually come with a warranty just in case anything goes wrong with them later on. I actually bought my little Pentax IQ Zoom from them about two years ago now, and I've had no problems with it. And again, this is probably my most used and most traveled camera since I bought it. Again, I will give the disclaimer that because their stuff is tested, cleaned, and sometimes refurbished, it is going to be a little bit more expensive. But to me, that's worth the extra money. I paid like $10 more for this camera than I did for the SureShot when I bought it off of eBay, which died two months later. We've got one more place to talk about on this list, so let's talk about Etsy. Apologize for the slight lighting change. I've been recording so long we've lost most of the natural sunlight. I know what you're thinking, Etsy? Isn't that for handmade stuff or art? And yes, mostly, but they do actually now have a vintage section and it's kind of taken on a like eBay vibe basically, but maybe with a slightly better shop system. With this comes the same pitfalls and warnings as shopping on eBay. Read listings carefully, try and find stuff that's been tested and works, etc, etc. But in my experience, the slightly better shop system makes it way easier to find reputable sellers who do test and clean their cameras and then just browse what they have, which makes it much easier to sift through the junk and find some genuinely good deals. Etsy is actually where I purchased my favorite camera that I own, this Fed 5B, which is a Soviet rangefinder camera based very heavily on the Leica style. I don't want to say Etsy is a perfect place to shop though. There's still some of the same pitfalls as shopping on eBay, along with my biggest pet peeve for shopping for film cameras ever. Picture this. The listing tells you everything about the camera. How great it is. How it's been cleaned up. It looks new. But then they say, quote, in beautiful condition. Everything appears to be functional, not tested. Like, I understand. Some people don't want to go through the hassle of buying film and testing an old camera. I get it. Not everyone's a photographer. But it makes the process of finding a good working camera so tedious. Okay, sorry for the rant. I just lost hours of my life that I'll never get back trying to find a good film camera on eBay and Etsy. Let's move on to the next topic. One thing to keep an eye out for when you're shopping for a camera is whether it's listed as a full kit or just a body. If you're looking at a point and shoot or a TLR, you probably don't need to worry about this because most of those cameras will come with integrated lenses that you can't remove. However, most SLR and rangefinder cameras do have interchangeable lenses, so just be on the lookout for that when you're reading descriptions about camera listings. That's not to say buying a camera body on its own is necessarily a bad thing, it can give you a much cheaper way into a specific camera system, especially if the seller doesn't really know what they have. It's just something to be on the lookout when you're shopping around so you don't think, man, I'm getting a good deal on this camera, only to get the package and be sorely disappointed because it's just the body of a camera. Since we're on the subject of interchangeable lenses, let's briefly talk about lenses. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on lenses in this video, but I do want to give you some basic terms and things to look for when you're reading a camera kit listing or trying to look into lenses you may want to buy. First, let's go over the naming structure of a lens because it can be a little bit confusing. As an example, we're going to look at two different lenses. This Nikon 50mm f1.8 and this Calamar 80-200 f3.9. If you don't know what any of that means, don't worry. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Let's just go piece by piece, starting with the Nikon as our example. Nikon is just the manufacturer of the lens. Pretty straightforward. 
Now 50 millimeter. This part is kind of self-explanatory. It's the focal length of the lens. It's not exactly a measurement of how long the lens is necessarily, but there is some correlation there. This is actually a measurement of the distance from where light enters to where it forms a sharp image on the focal plane of the camera. It also does tell you some information about the field of view and the magnification level of the lens. 50 millimeter is kind of the mid-range level of focal lengths for lenses. It's going to be more zoomed in than something like a 28 millimeter, but not quite as zoomed in as something like an 80 millimeter would. Basically, bigger number, bigger zoom. Okay, so we know it's a 50 millimeter lens made by Nikon that gives us an average level of zoom and an average field of view. Now, what about the F slash and the numbers after the focal length? F slash 1.8. This is what's referred to as your aperture or your F stop. They're different words, but they refer to the same thing. Basically the maximum size that your lens can open to, to let light in. This one is not as straightforward though. Your first thought may be, okay, bigger number, more light, easy. But of course that would be too easy. It's actually backwards. So F 1.8 is actually the biggest opening on this lens, not the smallest. The smallest on this lens is F 22. I promise the most confusing part about this though is just that the numbers are backwards. Once you get that part, it just tells you how much light you're letting in. So for example, at f1.8, you're letting in a lot of light, and if you stop it down to something like f11, you'll be letting in considerably less light. The amount of light that you're letting in is usually compared using the term stops, which just refers to doubling or halving the amount of light that you are exposing your film to. So for example, if you're using an aperture of f14 and you change that to an aperture of f5.6 and you don't change anything else you were letting in half of the amount of light that you were before try to think of this as less of an objective measurement and more as a tool to compare how you are changing your exposure by changing the settings on your camera there is one more piece to aperture that is important to discuss though and that is depth of field Depth of field is basically the size of your zone of focus, or the size of your acceptable focus level, basically. So for example, if your depth of field is around 5 feet, and you focus your camera on something that is 10 feet away, everything from 10 feet to 15 feet away will be in focus, and everything in front of your subject up to 10 feet away, and behind your subject from 15 feet on, will be out of focus to some degree. The factors that contribute to the size of this zone of focus are kind of complicated, so there are dedicated apps out there to calculate this, and your camera will sometimes have some kind of like range finder on it that will try and explain it, but it, there's generally a few factors that go into it. The easiest part of this that you can control is your f-stop, and it's a fairly easy relationship to grasp. Basically, the larger the f-stop you are using, the larger your zone of focus will be. So for example, on this lens at f1.8, that is the largest aperture opening we get and the smallest depth of field. So your subject will be sharp and in focus and pretty much everything else will be blurred to some level, usually pretty heavily at this wide of an aperture. This is very useful for something like portrait work where you really want to have a sharp separation between your subject and the background, but it's not as helpful for something like landscape shots where you usually want pretty much the entire scene in focus. Usually for something like that, you'll want a smaller aperture opening or a larger f-stop uh, which will give you a larger acceptable zone of focus something like f16 to f22 okay that was a lot of information but i think it's important knowledge to have before you waste film on out of focus or poorly exposed shots let's get back to the name of the lens that we are working on for this example nikon 50 millimeter f1.8 now we know that this is a 50 millimeter lens made by Nikon with a maximum aperture of f1.8. There is one more important term to cover with this lens though, and that is that it's what's called a prime lens. That just means that it only has one focal length, it is just a 50 millimeter lens. It doesn't have any kind of zoom functionality, it's just locked at 50 millimeters. I'll tell you more about what that means in just a minute, but for now let's repeat that naming process with the other lens. In case you have forgotten in the last few minutes, this is a Calamar 80 to 200 millimeter f 3.9 lens. So we now know that this is a lens made by Calamar. It has a focal length of 80 to 200 millimeters and a maximum aperture or f stop of f 3.9. You might have noticed something different about this one. It's a zoom lens. This allows you to use any focal length from 80 to 200 millimeters and your field of view will also adjust accordingly with that, obviously. Zoom lenses offer a lot of versatility in this 
this area, they let you change your field of view on the fly without having to swap lenses. The biggest downside to this is that due to the construction of zoom lenses, you can't get as wide of an aperture opening. So this lens only opens to a maximum aperture of f3.9. That f3.9 aperture is a considerably smaller maximum opening than this Nikon's f1.8. This difference in construction also means that they tend to be a little bit less sharp than their equivalent prime counterparts. For example, an 80 millimeter prime lens would be locked at 80 millimeters, but it would probably be considerably sharper than the 80 millimeter setting on this 80 to 200 zoom lens. Plus, it will probably have a wider maximum aperture opening giving you a little bit more versatility in some difficult lighting conditions. So why use a zoom lens? Honestly, it's the flexibility. Plus, especially the newer lenses you get, the sharpness difference is usually not a big make or break thing. This photo that I took of my parents' dog was taken on a zoom lens and it's still incredibly sharp. Zoom lenses are still great lenses. They just have some more trade-offs that you have to make in exchange for that versatility. Okay, that was a bit more in depth than I initially intended to go, but better to have more information than less. Back to the buying part of this discussion. When you're looking to buy a lens, the most important thing to look for is, does this work with my camera? This is usually a fairly simple question to answer, but if the camera you have or the lens you're looking at are a bit obscure, it may actually get a little dicey. What you're looking for is the mount type of your camera and the mount type of your lens. For example, going back to this Nikon lens, it uses their F mount and so does my Nikon N6006, so I can use them together. The mount or mounts that your camera accepts should be in the manual, so this is another reminder to go read that. If it's not in there or you can't find it when you're looking through, try and find a wiki article about your camera body on something like Camera Wiki or even Wikipedia. Those will usually at least mention the mount type in passing, if not have a detailed section about it. Next, you need to figure out what type of mount the lens has on it. If you're shopping from a dedicated camera store or website, the listing should include the mount type somewhere on the page. If you're shopping on something like eBay or Etsy, it could be a little bit harder to find though. What I usually try and do is find a picture of the lens where I can see the full name of the lens written out and I punch that into Google. From there, you can usually follow the same process of trying to find either a wiki page or a database page about the lens, and that should say something about the mount on there. This process can be a bit more complicated though, just due to the nature of how old film photography is. Camera and lens companies changed mounts often. Generic lens producers like this Calamar lens often made heaps of alternatives that were pretty cheap for decades, as well as hosts of other contributing factors that just make camera information for this kind of old gear a bit hard to find. If you still can't figure out the lens mount type at this point, you'll probably just have to make a judgment call on if it's worth it to you if the lens doesn't actually fit your camera. One last thing to look out for is any mention of fungus or fogging inside the lens. This is just another part of film gear being really old, but just be on the lookout for that when you're shopping around. This won't necessarily always cause negative results in your photos, but they definitely can cause your images to look flat or out of focus, so just be cautious. All right, let's finally move on to the fun part, taking pictures. All right, so you have your camera and you have your film. Now it's time to shoot. Again, do yourself a favor and have your manual handy for this whole process. It's going to save you a lot of headaches. Loading is going to be a little bit different camera to camera, so I won't go through that in detail here. Just get the film in your camera and get it ready to shoot. It's possible you'll need to replace the batteries if your camera takes any, so be sure to have those on hand. I will warn you that some film cameras do take some kind of obscure batteries, so you'll probably either have to order them online, if not outright replace them with a substitute. This will again vary camera to camera, so please consult your manual, but if you're unsure, please check the internet. Someone has probably made a forum post or a YouTube video or article about it somewhere that could help you out. Related to step one, if you're not using a point and shoot, you'll probably have to manually set your camera's ISO. The film stock that you select is actually what determines your ISO. You're just telling the camera's internal light meter basically what film stock you're using so it can set it accordingly. And again, just to reiterate, the ISO for the film stock is usually in the name. So for example, I'm using Cinestill 800T, 
which is 800 speed film. So I'm going to set my camera's ISO to 800 to match that. And again, this isn't like digital where you can just raise the ISO if you need light. Uh, with this film, I'm locked at 800 ISO. And if this isn't enough light, uh, you'll either have to use a flash or you just straight up can't take a picture. Or if you do, it'll just come out underexposed if you want to risk it. So once you've loaded your camera and set your ISO, you're ready to go shoot. Again, read your manual to learn exactly how your camera works and go out and take some pictures. I know this is a fairly daunting thing to do since you don't get to see your photos and how they're coming out as you're shooting, but I promise the best way to learn with film photography is to just go out and take some pictures and see how it comes out. While we're here, I do want to give you a brief introduction to manual exposure. I want to make a full separate video about this topic soon, but for now, here's a quick introduction. Exposure is made up of three components, ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. These three components are usually referred to collectively as the exposure triangle. They work together and interact to give you your final exposure. If you're shooting film, the ISO section of your exposure triangle is locked. It's set with your film speed and you can't change that. This means you'll primarily be using aperture and shutter speed to control your final exposure. Again, I'm not gonna go super in depth on these for now, I'll just give you some quick tips on balancing them. Shutter speed, at least to me, is the easier part of this equation. Shutter speed just controls how long your shutter will stay open. The biggest thing you need to watch out for for this is setting it too slow. It can be tempting to just keep lowering your shutter speed until you can get enough light to make your exposure, but if you're shooting handheld like you will be in most situations, lowering your shutter speed too far can actually introduce camera shake. This comes from your hands shaking while you're taking the picture and it can make your pictures come out really blurry. Typically the best practice is to stay at or above your focal length. So if the lens you're using is a 50 millimeter, you'll want to keep your shutter speed at 1 60th or faster to keep everything sharp and in focus. Usually this isn't a huge deal, but if you start getting into low light settings or concerts or anything like that, it can get a little bit tricky. Now let's talk about aperture. Since aperture controls how much light is coming into your photos and the overall depth of field, to me it makes a much more obvious difference to the look of your final photo. With film, you're going to be constantly balancing wanting to use a smaller aperture like f8 to f11 to try and get more things in focus with needing to open up your aperture more to let more light in. I find myself constantly having to fight this even shooting outdoors in the day sometimes. Basically, if you shoot with anything slower than an ISO 400 film, you're pretty much going to be constantly battling this because of the ISO limitation. Probably the thing that's going to be the most jarring the first few times that you shoot film compared to digital is not getting to see the photos as you're taking them. This was a huge learning curve for me when I first started because I was new to photography in general too, so it was just a much slower learning process overall. Over the few years I've been shooting though, this has kind of become more of a feature and less a bug. Especially when I'm shooting a new film stock or using a new camera for the first time, it's a really exciting process to finally get the scans back and see how they came out. It also forces you to slow down and really think about each frame since you can't just keep taking the same picture over and over, checking the shot and retaking it. You obviously can take multiple exposures of the same photo, I do that all the time, but for the sake of efficiency and your wallet, you probably won't want to do that every time. One of the most helpful things you can do for yourself when you're first starting out is taking notes about your exposure settings. Especially if you're new to photography in general or just new to manual photography, this can make the learning process a bit less painful. You can do this in a notebook or a note on your phone or use one of the dedicated apps that are out there now for it, but the idea is generally the same across all of these formats. You're basically going to write down the subject of the photo and or the frame number, just something to keep track of what picture this is so you can reference it when you're looking at your scans later. With this, you'll want to write down the film stock you used. You could do this for the whole roll or frame by frame, whatever works best for you, the shutter speed you used, and the aperture you used. Trust me when I say this will save you so much time of trial and error, figuring out why one frame came out perfectly and the next one was blurry or super underexposed. I personally did this in a notebook, but use whatever tool will be easiest to make you actually use it when you're out shooting. If your camera is manual exposure and does not have a dedicated internal light meter, you'll need one of these. 
This is what's called a light meter. It's basically just reading the light that's coming into it the same way your camera would if it had an internal light meter. Now, like anything film related, because these are old and kind of hard to get your hands on, they can be a bit expensive. Luckily for you, there are also plenty of app versions of these that actually work really well. I only have experience with iPhone apps in this department, but I would recommend My Light Meter Pro. It has a couple of different modes, and it also lets you save presets for different lenses or cameras. This will allow you to automatically automatically restrict the settings it shows you to only what your gear can actually do. Another incredibly useful feature that it has is that it will let you save a picture of whatever you just metered with the exposure settings it recommends overlaid on it. This is basically the taking notes thing we just talked about, but done completely for you. So again, this is a great app. This is the one that I used before I got this light meter, and I also still use it for my movie film or any other situation when I don't happen to have a light meter on me. Even if your camera does have an internal light meter, it's still probably a good idea to have one of these apps on your phone. Let's say you're out shooting and the battery in your camera dies. Well, in my Minolta cameras, the battery only controls the light meter, meaning it can still be used in manual mode without a battery. I just use one of these apps for the light meter and we're back up and running. Now, armed with all of these tips, you've gone out and you've shot your first roll of film. You may be tempted to immediately open the back of your camera and take the film out. Hold your horses. You have successfully exposed your film, but it needs to be wound back into its canister first before you open the back of your camera, or you will expose all of it to the blinding lights and then ruin all the photos you've just taken. If your camera's from the later years of film or it just has some more automated or electronic features, it may rewind it for you. But trust me, you'll 100% know if it already has. It's loud and it takes a minute. so you definitely did not miss it. Chances are, if your camera has some kind of automated loading process, it will also have some kind of automated rewinding or at least assisted rewinding. My Nikon N6006 has automated loading and the rewinding is mostly automated. You just have to hold down this button on the bottom. Again, if you aren't sure, consult your manual. It's usually in the same section that talks about loading film. Once you've retrieved your film, congratulations. You've shot your first roll film and congratulations on your new addiction. You may now be thinking, okay, well, how do I get these on my phone so I can share them on Instagram and show people how cool I am? Relax, we're getting there. At this point in the process, your film has been exposed, but the chemicals need to be developed so the pictures show up. This is aptly called developing. For this step in the process, you will either need a bunch of really expensive chemicals in a dark room, or you can just send it to a lab. We'll come back to labs in just a minute. After the film is developed, it will look something like this. These are what are usually referred to as negatives. Think of these like the physical copies of your images. These negatives can then be scanned into high quality digital copies and converted into positive images. Now you have an actual picture that you can share on Instagram. There you go. This is where Film Labs come in. Usually Film Labs will offer both of these services together in a bundle. So you can mail your film off to them and in a few short days, you get an email with your scans. This feels a lot like Christmas morning, complete with the disappointment of not always getting exactly what you wanted. Say lovey. Since the lab is handling pretty much everything, the overall process of getting your film developed and scanned is pretty straightforward, but there are some things to look out for. First things first, do not take your film to a drugstore or anything like that. Walmart, CVS, Rite Aid, similar stores like that, they used to do film developing and have photo labs back in the day, but nowadays they don't do anything in-house. It will be mailed somewhere and I've heard and seen horror stories of terrible results, lost film, and everything in between. It's not worth the opinion parent convenience. Instead, see if there's a photo lab local to you that you can support. It will save you time and money if you can just drop your film off somewhere and you can avoid the weight of having to mail your film off at all. Usually the easiest way to find this is just to Google something like film developing in blank or photo lab in blank. If there's not somewhere super close to you, your best bet probably is just going to be to mail it off to a lab that you find online. So let's talk about that now. The best lab for you is totally going to depend on exactly what you're looking for, but if you don't know where to start, I would recommend either The Dark Room or Memphis Film Lab. Unfortunately, and ironically, not based in Memphis anymore. 
Either of these labs will give you great results for a pretty reasonable price, and they both also do some minor image tweaks and corrections so that you won't have to do any of that yourselves. Your scans will be good to go and post on the gram as soon as you get them. There are a few terms that you'll need to know when you're going to place your order at a lab. First will usually be the film format that you're wanting developed and scanned. This is pretty straightforward, just find the film format that you're using and select that. Most film labs will handle 35mm and 120 for sure. 110 is likely, but anything outside of those formats will kind of depend on the specific lab, so just be sure to check their website if you're looking to get a more obscure film format developed. The next option you will usually see is going to be scan size or quality. This is basically the resolution of the scan you want. The higher the quality, the more detail, but also the more expensive it will be. Usually the base scan size a film lab will offer will be plenty good enough for you to post online, send to your friends and family, or print in smaller sizes like 4x6 or 5x7. If you're looking to do any kind of professional work or get it printed in any larger size, you will probably need to pay for higher resolution scans though. Do note though, you aren't permanently locked into this scan resolution. You can get your film rescanned later if you get your negatives returned to you. So for instance, if you get a smaller scan done now, but you decide later that you really like one of these pictures and you want to get a larger print of it done, you can send them off to a lab again or a local place near you and get higher quality scans done. This is ultimately the biggest benefit of having your negatives returned to you. You can always get them rescanned later. If you can remember all the way back to the beginning of this video when we talked about film, one of the things I mentioned was the different types of film. Color negative, color positive or slide, and black and white. Each of these different types of films also has their own dedicated chemical process required to process them. Color negative film typically uses C41, color positive or slide film usually uses E6, movie film typically uses ECN2, and black and white film usually just has its own label because there's a bunch of different chemicals you can use for that. If you aren't sure exactly which chemical process your film stock falls under, you can usually do a quick Google search and find either a store listing or a wiki article that has the chemical process somewhere on it. In some cases, the film lab will also just have a drop down menu that lets you select the exact film stock you're using and they will do the chemical process work for you. If you want to, this is where you can get prints of all the photos from your roll sent back to you with your negatives. They're usually going to be 4x6, but some labs will offer more options, it just kind of depends on the lab. Cross-processing is telling the lab to process your film in a different chemical process than it is intended to be processed in. This can give you some really cool color shifts and effects. Please note, you cannot undo this. These colors and everything that comes with them will be baked into the negatives directly, which means you can't just get them rescanned or something if you don't like how the photos come out. If you're curious about the look of this process or how it comes out, I'll leave some articles and stuff in the description. Push or pull processing is when you deliberately shoot your film at a higher or lower ISO than what it is rated for and compensate for that under or over exposure by changing the developing times. For example, if you wanted to shoot this roll of Cinestill 800T at 1600 ISO, then that would be pushing the film by one stop. If you wanted to shoot it at 400 ISO, that would be pulling the film by one stop. I would recommend when you are just starting out to just stick to box speed and learn that process. Pushing and pulling film has its uses, but I deliberately didn't cover it more earlier because it adds more unpredictable results and it gives you another variable to account for when you're just learning. I will be doing a separate video on the subject of pushing and pulling film later though, so if you're interested in that, keep an eye out for it. These options are usually in a similar spot. You're basically just deciding if you want your negatives shipped back to you and if you want them cut into strips and sleeved or just returned as the whole roll. There's usually a small upcharge to cut and sleeve them for you, but to me that's worth saving the hassle. But ultimately what you want to do with this just kind of depends on what you want to do with your negatives once you get them back. And trust me, this one is way less scary than it sounds. When I shot my first few rolls, I just dropped them off at Memphis Film Labs in their Dropbox. But after I started shooting more and started taking it a little bit more seriously, Memphis Film Labs had already moved out of state, so I had to start mailing my film off. In three years and almost 100 rolls of film that I have shot and sent off, I've never had any problems with mailing my film. You've just got to be a bit careful and deliberate with it, and you'll be alright. 
Here are some easy tips for making sure your film makes the journey safely. First off, avoid those little envelope mailers like the plague. Too soon? Either way, they are prone to ripping when you have something oddly shaped, like film canisters, inside them. When I first started mailing my film off, I did use these a couple times, again with no issues. But if you read the frequently asked questions section of most Film Labs websites, they will specifically mention not to use these. Because even if it is rare, they can rip and get damaged easier than putting your film in a box will. I use these little self-sealing boxes at the post office and they have never failed me. They're the perfect size for even a decent sized film dump and you don't have to worry about having tape or anything else like that with you to seal it. This makes it really convenient for me to bring the film that I want to mail off with me to work and then to run over to the post office on my lunch break and send it off. What I usually do is gather up all of the film that I'm ready to send off and I'll throw it all into a Ziploc bag together. This is mostly just preventing them all from sliding around in the box and to keep them all together should something happen to the box and just to make the lab's job a little bit easier. I don't actually know if it does that or not, but I like to think it does. After I've got all of that together, I'll go to my lab's website and I'll go ahead and place my order. Then I'll grab a little sticky note and I'll write down my name and my order number on it and then stick it in the Ziploc bag with my film. This actually does make it easier for the labs. I know that one for sure. I think Memphis Film Lab asks you to do this with your order, so I just kept doing it regardless of where I send my film. Also be sure to check, some labs ask you to put your order number on the outside of the package as well. From here, you can either take it just like this to the post office and mail it off, or you can package it up yourself. Any old box should be fine, you just gotta drop your film in and slap a label on it. I go back and forth on how much it matters if you throw any kind of like filling in the box with the film. I've thrown like crumpled paper or leftover bubble wrap in there before, but honestly, usually I don't put anything else in the box. I'm usually using a fairly small box, so there's not really a ton of space to fill anyways, but it definitely can't hurt, so use your best judgment. I've kind of alluded to this already, but I do usually use uh, USPS to mail my film off. Any shipping service is probably fine, just be sure to check the lab's website for any kind of like shipping or mailing section and see if they have any preference or shipping partners or anything like that. Some labs will also include a shipping label in your order, or at least give you an option to buy a prepaid label that you can print out and attach yourself. I use Nice Film Lab for most of my developing and scanning, and they include a USPS postage label with my membership. Super convenient. After you've left your precious film in the hands of whatever shipping god that you've chosen, now begins the least fun part of film photography. Waiting. It should only take a couple of business days for your film to arrive safely at the lab. Usually your lab will send you some kind of confirmation whenever they receive your film, but you can always just check the tracking information from your shipment to see whenever it arrives. The exact timeline for when you'll get your scans kind of depends on the lab that you're using. There should be a section on your lab's website with a estimation for about how long it'll take you to get your scans after they receive your film. In my anecdotal experience, it usually takes about two to three weeks from mailing off film to getting scans. It can definitely be quicker than that, but between unpredictable shipping times and then potential lab delays when they're at their busiest seasons, I like to estimate on the longer end. But just when you start to lose hope, you'll get the blessed email. Your scans are ready. It's like Christmas morning. I generally like to save up my rolls to send off in bigger orders, so I usually get four to five sets of scans back at once, and the level of dopamine that that brings me is unparalleled. Depending on the lab that you're using, you could receive your scans in a few different ways. In my case, Nice Film Lab has an online portal that holds all of my scans, so that's where I head immediately. As you can see on their portal, you can see the film stock that this roll is, a preview panel that you can click through, a digital contact sheet to see all of your photos at a glance, and the most important button, download. However you get your scans from your lab, once you download them, give them a look. Enjoy the dopamine, feel the addiction pull you in. If you listen close enough, you can hear the money leaving your wallet and climbing into your camera. This is where the process may differ a little bit depending on the lab and your own preferences. So let me explain. Depending on the lab that you went with, your scans may already have some corrections done, or they could be what's called flat scans. Just due to the nature of taking a physical negative image and then scanning it to a digital copy and inverting it, it's going to look weird if you just straight up invert the colors. 
you've inherently got to do some level of color correcting on the scanning side so that the colors look a little bit normal. Here's a clip from one of my favorite film YouTubers, Jason from Grainy Days, demonstrating this on his scanning setup. If you're scanning and editing color negative film like we'll be doing in this video, there's technically no right way to flip your image. Every time a negative is inverted into a positive, what you're seeing is an interpretation. Whether it's the lab's interpretation, the scanning software's interpretation, your own interpretation, etc., there's no absolute way to invert your image. So. Maybe it's time we kill this stigma of editing your film scans is a sin worse than masturbating in church. From this point on, I believe all of your edits should be entirely in service of your photographic vision. As you can see from this, some level of correction is going to be necessary. It's more just a matter of having the lab do it or doing it yourself. For comparison, let's look at some of my scans from two different labs that I've used for most of my film journey, Memphis Film Lab and Nice Film Club. Memphis Film Lab is the first lab that I use, and I still use them occasionally for some different formats that NICE doesn't do, like APS Film or 110 Film. A quick peek at their website tells you that they, quote, automatically adjust each frame for exposure and color. And this is also included with the price of scanning. For me, that's the most painstaking part of editing film, so this is a fantastic value, especially because their base 35mm color scans start at just $9 a roll. $9. I'll put some of the images that I've gotten from them over the years on screen now. They do fantastic work and all of the scans that I've gotten from them have looked great. The colors are nice and the correction work that they do is like spot on. It's so great that I didn't even realize one of my cameras was constantly overexposing by around two full stops until I sent the film to a different lab that doesn't correct images. Definitely recommend. Nice Film Club is primarily where I'm sending my film now. I primarily moved because Nice offers a yearly subscription plan that gets you 10 free rolls worth of scans up front and then a substantial discount on all of your scans going forward for the rest of the year. So those 2K high res scans only end up coming out to about $10 a roll. At the time I moved, I was shooting a lot of film and looking to upgrade my scan quality anyways, so this was an immediately enticing offer. The trade-off to this is they don't do as much correction as Memphis Film Labs does. Again, there's some level of correction inherently needed to correct scans and make them look like actual pictures, but these are closer to what would be considered flat scans. This is both a pro and a con. The con is that images require more editing and correction on my end, but the pro is that it really forces you to get a good exposure and it will show really quickly if you have any gear problems. You can't hide behind any corrections at all. But this is probably not the best route to go if you're just starting out. Most bigger labs offer scans that are already exposure, color, density, and contrast corrected for you, so the scans will basically be ready to go as soon as you get the download link. This is similar to how it used to be done in the darkroom, where they would convert and add larger images for you already, just done for the digital age. I would highly recommend going this way when you're first starting out, especially if you're new to photography in general. Spending the time and money to shoot your first roll of film and getting the scans back to see a flat image that may not even be properly exposed would be discouraging to say the least. I know I probably would not have kept shooting if I saw that as my first roll. When I got started, I also had no experience in photography or photo editing at all, so I wouldn't have even known where to begin. Is it supposed to look like this? Did I do something wrong? What did I do wrong? Just save yourself some frustration at the beginning and send it somewhere that will take care of that stuff for you. If you decide you want to learn the editing process later, you can always change labs. But if you get discouraged early, it's possible you won't stick with it. Before we wrap up here, let's briefly talk about editing. If you go to just about any film photography related community on the internet, you probably won't have to scroll too far to find this argument. One person is asking for tips on how to correct an image they took, and someone else is yelling at them in the comments that if you're going to edit your film, you might as well just shoot digital. It's a touchy subject. I'll just lay it out on the table. I edit all of my photos. People have been correcting their film photos in the darkroom for almost as long as film photography has existed. And just because the negatives are now on your phone or your computer doesn't instantly change the medium into something else. If my photo comes out looking like green puke, but I know I could correct that with one slider, why would I not do that? That's how it's supposed to look. Film isn't supposed to look any one way. It's a medium of photography. There are creative limitations that are inherent to film photography, but editing your film photo is not some eternal heresy that will get you banned from B&H. It's your art and your photos, so do with them as you please. 
As far as how to edit them, that's a question I can't answer for you. Ultimately, it's up to you and how you want the photo to look in the end. Personally, I don't do too much to my photos, but I'll give you a brief overview real quick. I usually start by raising my black point a little bit and lowering my highlights. I tend to err on overexposing my film, so sometimes the highlights can get a little bit unruly. From there, I may do some light contrast adjusting if I had to shoot in harsh lighting, but I usually don't touch anything else on the lighting section. Color balance is usually where I spend most of my time. I generally prefer a fairly neutral white balance in my photos. Sometimes I lean a little bit more into the cooler color side, but I generally lean most towards a neutral balance. The part that I struggle with the most and that I'm still learning is correcting color cast and then actually color grading creatively. I basically do zero color grading right now because it scares me. So white balancing is mostly what I'm doing here. As far as the other sections go, I usually just do some small tweaks and a few other spots. First, I do like to sharpen my photos a good bit. Film can be a little bit soft and a little sharpening never hurts. Just go easy on this because there is a fine line between clear and a literal sword. Recently, I've also been pulling back the texture and clarity a bit just to smooth out some sharp edges and give my photos a bit of a glow. I know this feels a little bit counterintuitive after sharpening, but if I toggle them on and off in combination, you can see the small differences. Just take it or leave it. I go back and forth on if I crop my photos to a specific aspect ratio, but the last few months I've just been leaving it at 3x2. I don't think I said this earlier, but 3x2 is the natural aspect ratio of 35mm film, and that's what I shoot most of. I've mostly been leaving it at 3x2 because I found that when I try and edit with different ratios, I end up cutting something off or missing something in the frame because while I'm actually out shooting, I'm looking through the viewfinder, which is in a 3x2 ratio, and I'm not thinking about a different aspect ratio in my head. Again, cropping and aspect ratios and stuff is your creative choice, so do with that what you will. Ultimately, your choice to edit or not, and how to edit your photos if you do, should be in service of your creative vision for your photography. I do tend to lean towards the view that if you are changing basically everything about your photo, then you should probably shoot digital just to give yourself more flexibility, but that's just my personal opinion. If you both love film photography and love to edit your photos in a very specific way, please do that. Again, it's your art and your choice on how you get there. We did it. Thanks for sticking here all the way to the end. If you skipped ahead and gotten here to the end, I'll never know, so I guess still thank you. I know this video was super long, but I wanted it to be all in one part to kind of stand as a reference manual for anyone wanting to get started in film photography. It will always be here if you need to reference it again later, so feel free to use the timestamps to skip around or to come back to parts that you need to. Just use it as you need. Also, even with how long this video is, I couldn't get to everything I wanted to, so if there's something I didn't cover or something you want to know more about, please let me know in the comment section. I mentioned this all the way at the beginning of the video, but I want to follow up this video with a Q&A to answer the most commonly asked questions or fill in any kind of gaps that people are curious about. So again, leave those questions down below. If you found this video helpful and want to see more of this kind of content, be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with my video releases. This is my first video, but I plan on doing one to two videos a month from here on out. This video took hours and hours of work over a few weeks between writing and editing the script, filming the video, editing the video, designing the visuals, finding the references, screen recording, all that jazz. So if you'd like to support the channel, you can check out my print shop or my socials that are both linked in the description down below. I'm also debating starting a Patreon for the channel, so if there's enough interest, I might do that. Just let me know down in the comments if you'd like to see that. I think that about covers everything, so uh, thank you for watching and have a fantastic rest of your day.